Oh hi, I'm the Heretic. So today we're looking at the redemption of St. Paul on the road to Damascus. It's an important part of his backstory. You see, while the New Testament shows him to be a great evangelist spreading the word of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, Gentile meaning non-Jew, it wasn't always this way. Early in his life, his name was Saul. His name is changed to Paul later. He was a Pharisee tasked with hunting and jailing the followers of Jesus Christ by the high priesthood of statism, uh, I mean, the high priesthood of the Jewish temple. Yeah. If nothing else, this should give you some context, as he's kind of an important character in the New Testament. Just a little bit. At the point of our story, he's already gained a reputation for hunting and driving out the proto-Christians from Jewish territory. Then, well, as he is on his way to do some more Christian hunting, something amazing happens. Let's watch. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he would take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. For three days he was blind, and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him just how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Wow, Saul was a dick. Yes, really. He starts out at Jerusalem, and we know this because the high priests under Judaism can literally only be appointed at the temple. He travels 150 miles to Damascus just to persecute Christians. That's a crazy distance for the time. Really shows his commitment to taking care of those pesky heretics. Wait. Now just to clarify, the Bible references the way. This is what proto-Christianity is known at the time, so don't get confused. Anyways, I should point out that Saul, or again Paul, at the time is not a malicious person. Anyone willing to go to this length for this long to jail Christians has to earnestly believe that they are doing God's work. He's a fanatic, the kind of moral busybody who throws you in jail for committing victimless crimes for your own good. He's the kind of tyrant who mistakes his sadism and cruelty for the will of God. We know this because that's exactly what he's doing. It's kind of hard to imagine that this kind of guy is not only the one who would have a change of heart at all, but that God would chose to spread his word to the Gentiles with. But he does, and he did. So tell me, what does this say about God's love and mercy that he sends his own son to save this guy? Now there's a lot that goes on here, so forgive me if I'm a bit out of order. Saul is struck blind by the experience. Say, blindness, where have I heard that metaphor used before? If you're paying attention, then you already know that blindness in the Bible is used to symbolize spiritual blindness. I really don't think characters who are struck blind are made to be spiritually blind, but made aware of the limitation that they already have. Saul, in this case, is confronted by Jesus, who appears to him in light, and made to answer for why he is persecuting him. What's interesting is that Saul's first reply is, who are you, Lord? He recognizes Jesus as God, but has the humility to understand that he does not know him. Now, this is profound. 
Saul earnestly thought he was doing God's work going after Christians, only to be rebuked by the very God he thought he was serving. It only makes sense that Saul was blind all along and was only made aware of his limitation by the grace of God. After all, you have to know the problem to get the solution. Now, it's worth noting that Saul's companions are witnesses to this event. He wasn't having some kind of hallucination or epileptic seizure. They all heard a sound, or depending on your translation of choice, a voice, but couldn't see anyone. So I think we could rule out insanity on Paul's part. Yay! So Saul goes to Damascus, as Jesus instructed him to, and spends three days in prayer and fasting, or at least, fasting is the best way to interpret going for three days with no food in the city. Here, Jesus calls to one of his followers, Ananias, to meet Paul, and he's like, wait, I gotta meet who? Saul of Tarsus is literally the Inquisition, and to say Christians didn't like him would be putting it mildly. Suffice to say, God is surely aware of this. But what is interesting is that what comes after, when Jesus tells Ananias that Saul is his chosen vessel, one to proclaim his name to the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. You see, God knows what's in Saul's heart. He knows why Saul traveled down 150 mile road to Damascus and jailed Christians so zealously. He wanted to please God. He was just doing it all wrong. The way I see it, and forgive me if I am presuming to know God's will, I don't, but I imagine that God is seeing what's in Saul's heart, seeing his enthusiasm, and imagining, huh, if he could use that zeal for good instead of evil, imagine what he could accomplish. Oh wait, he doesn't have to imagine. Ananias is able to overcome his apprehension and lay his hands on Saul, filling him with the Holy Spirit. His blindness is cured. Now think about this from Paul's perspective. His entire spiritual worldview has just been turned on his head, and the people he thought were acting against God turn out to be the ones who save him. This has got to be a deeply humbling experience. He was reborn through baptism and is now ready to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Everyone loves a good redemption story. The villain is shown the error of their ways, and seeking to repent and knowing evil firsthand, they become the greatest champions for good. Darth Vader, Jean Valjean, Oscar Schindler, to name a few, both historical and fictional. It's a timeless story that shows that there is hope for everyone, even the worst of us, but most importantly, for us as individuals. But what does all this mean? I think this explores the nature of forgiveness. God's mercy and love extends even to the worst of us. Saul is not a good guy. I think it's quite telling that he was found by Ananias in the house of Judas. You know, the guy who betrayed Jesus. But when Saul realized the error of his ways, he repented. He acknowledged his error and sought to improve, sought forgiveness. I think the takeaway here is twofold. Firstly, have you ever done anything wrong in your life? Of course you have. We're all sinners, and let's be honest, we probably will again. What have you done? Taken roommates' food without asking? Got mad and hit someone? Maybe you're a statist. Have the humility to recognize that even if you have a perfectly good reason for the problem, whatever it may be, you, yes you, had a part in it and you should act accordingly, apologize where it's appropriate, and humbly ask for the explanation of your error if such is not clear. Secondly, be ready to grant forgiveness. It sounds silly to think about, but when the time comes, someone who has wronged you repeatedly suddenly turns around and is seeking your forgiveness, what do you do? Are you ready to let go of that resentment and suspicion you are undoubtedly holding on to? Will you be judging if they are worthy of your forgiveness? It's easy to fall into a trap. Think to Ananias, someone who has already accepted Jesus Christ, but was reluctant to follow God's plan. For completely understandable reasons, mind you. It goes without saying that an important part of forgiveness, both in giving and receiving, is repentance, acknowledgement of the error, and a promise to do better. Otherwise, forgiveness is meaningless at best and pathological altruism at worst. Think of the stories where school kids are forced by the parents into giving half-hearted sorries to their neighbor. There's a middle ground between openness and suspicion. God calls on all of us, not just to repent, but to be repented too. If someone like friggin' Saul can not only be forgiven, but called upon to do great things, why can't you? One last takeaway, if you're persecuting people who aren't hurting anybody, you're probably in the wrong. Just saying.